And that's one of the neat things, neat things, neat things about street machining and high performance in general is there are no rules. No rules. No rules. You can build anything you want. There are no rules. You can do whatever you want. I'm a Chevy man. I love Chevys. What brings you here? Volleyball. Women. Women. Yeah. Cars. <laughs> Well, they got cars here, too? Yeah, a few. Damn, I, I didn't notice, notice any of them I yet. I a couple of them. You see everything, everything, everything here. You see everything here. Anybody would find something that they would like at this show. DeCoin, Illinois, is not unlike any of the innumerable Midwestern towns and middle-class communities splashed across the central United States. Located in the extreme southern half of the state, it's a town which is almost distinctive in its purely traditional Middle American look, layout, and character. On the first weekend of summer of 1992, DuCoin experienced an abrupt change in appearance, personality, and character for the sixth consecutive year as an event once again unfolded on the outskirts of this town that with each succeeding year becomes even more spectacular. The DuCoin State Fairgrounds was the site, and for three exhilarating days in June, the spacious grounds and lazy paths of that facility were transformed into a dizzying circus of wild paintwork, polished aluminum, ominous exhaust notes, and meticulous craftsmanship. These were the Street Machine Nationals. The 92 Street Machine Nationals were part of the BF Goodrich Performance Series, a lineup of seven events held in various locations around the country, which invite the owners, builders, and admirers of street rods and street machines to get together and party. The Street Machine Nationals for 92 attracted participants from no less than 33 states and Canada. The event's home state of Illinois boasted the most number of entries, but there were cars here from as far away as Florida and California. For anyone who loves street machines, this is, without a doubt, the most prestigious and talked about smorgasbord of street legal iron which has ever been assembled on an annual basis. Over 3,500 street machines would be rumbling through the fairground gates over the three days of the meet. 110,000 spectators would be making the street machine nationals a small town in itself. Jeff Smith is the editor of Hot Rod Magazine, recognized as the most respected publication covering the hot rodding and street rodding sports. We asked him to give us some of the background on this event and why it has become the ultimate street machine get-together. This is the Carcraft Street Machine Nationals. It's been held since 1977. It's been about four or five different venues. And uh, what it is is a street machine event. It's, it's one of the largest, if not the largest, street machine event in the country, outdoor car show. And uh, originally it was, it was uh, put on by Carcraft Magazine, uh, which I used to be the editor of uh, for four years. And um, it was put on as a promotional event for the magazine and has since grown into its own entity. And Bruce Hubley's uh, group now runs, the special events now runs the event. And uh, it's, it's, it's a nice, it is the, the, sort of the granddaddy of the street machine outdoor street machine shows. And uh, they usually generate about 3,500 cars and I believe in the neighborhood of over 100,000 spectators for the weekend. This, this particular car is, uh, is a car that we're shooting right now for a spread in Hot Rod Magazine. And uh, what it is, it sort of represents the high-end street machine marketplace. You've, you've got a wide spectrum of vehicles represented here, every, everything from 
your everyday street machine that the, that the young kid drives back and forth to school, back and forth to work, and he puts literally every dime he owns into it. Uh, and then uh, you go up from there to, to vehicles that represent uh, maybe a weekend car, a guy that puts a lot of effort into, maybe he's a little bit older, he can afford to spend money on custom body work and, a, and, a, and maybe a supercharger, a lot of engine components, maybe some suspension components, on up through the high-end cars that we call pro street cars, like this car here. Uh, this particular car is, is a um, 91 Oldsmobile, uh, pro street car, it's a full tube chassis. A uh, gentleman bought it as a wrecked vehicle and, uh, and then completely stripped the thing down, built his own custom tube chassis. It's got a supercharged big block Chevy engine in it. And uh, it probably is, I think he spent the last two and a half years working on this thing straight through. And it represents the high-end type of vehicle. This is not the kind of car you drive every day. Uh, it, it is as much a, uh, an indoor car show kind of vehicle as much as it is represents a high-end street machine. And there's a certain amount of com uh, competition between all the, all the uh, event uh, participants here. They're looking to see who can build the baddest car. Now, the neat thing about street machining is you, there are no rules. You can do anything you want. Um, just for the record, for street machine is defined as any street car, uh, 1949 and later. Uh, there are some street rods here because they allow them in, but pretty much you see either street machine events or street rod events, and a street rod would be a, a 48 or earlier car. Um, and that delineation was made, oh, 20 years or so ago based on the fact that they needed some delineation and that was based on whether the car had running boards or not, or bolt-on fenders. Uh, there's a lot of terminology that goes along with these cars. It's, it's, it's a whole lexicon all, all done to itself. And uh, some, of the, some of the terms you'll hear besides street rod and street machine would be pro street, which this car represents. And typically a pro street car, the only real definition that, def or the only thing that really defines a pro street car is those really fat tires in the back. They're made by Mickey Thompson. Uh, they're typically anywhere from 18 to 22 inches in width. Each tire is that wide. They're 33 inches tall. Monster tires, they're completely Department of Transportation legal. They have tread. They've been tested. Um, that really sort of defines a pro street car. That's a very popular uh, modification you'll see here. You might see a car that's otherwise pretty much stock, let's say a 69 Camaro, and all he's really done is cut the, the frame out of the car in the back, put big aluminum or steel tubs in the back, narrowed the rear end housing, and maybe as much as uh, 15 or 20 inches, and then stuff these big fat tires under the back with some sort of a drag race inspired suspension. Um, a supercharger, uh, as you see on this car, is, uh, is the, the big aluminum box, a polished aluminum box you see sitting on top of the engine. And that really was uh, derived from the drag racers starting using superchargers back in the 60s, and, which, and the original application for these things were actually diesel trucks and um, it's a, called a root supercharger and what it does is it forces air down in the engine creates a lot more power and so that's, that's a real typical modification uh, some of the other things you'll hear about will be uh, oh transmissions for example automatics uh, have been popular for a long time the, the manual transmissions are not coming back there's five speeds there's even some new six speeds that are coming out overdrive transmissions uh, fuel injection is a real popular item uh, you'll see a lot of modifications done in the fuel system and the induction system. That's a real popular thing for, for the hot rider to do because it's a way to enhance the power. A major reason that street machines have fired up such an enormous popularity from coast to coast is the widespread of makes and models that provide the starting point for these prowling overlords of the street. At this year's event, 50% of the cars that attended were Chevrolets. Not a surprise, since the great interchangeability of Chevy parts and their endless availability make building a Chevy-based street machine a lot easier. 
Fords totaled 17 percent of the entries. In all, there were 34 makes and 288 models jamming the fairgrounds in 92. The name played most in evidence, Camaro. While among the Ford faction, Mustangs were most popular. Well, it's a picnic-like atmosphere. We don't judge the vehicles. Um, the vehicle owners judge themselves. So Susan Davis, Vice President of Public Relations for Special Events, the organization which performed weekend. much of the hands-on work in staging the event, gave us some insights on why it's so special. It's a fun time to exchange information. There are a lot of activities that do go on, planned activities. There's a burnout contest, a no-touch burnout contest. Uh, BF Goodrich has a precision driving challenge that allows the vehicle owners to get into a Ford flare side and run it through a short course and, and try to match a time. Uh, we have a jet ski competition. It's a family event uh, in many aspects. There are a lot of children in strollers. You see moms and dads walking through. This is the largest gathering of street machines in the world, and it's covered by the international press, and I think that's one of the reasons that people come out here is because this is the place to be seen, and it's also the place to gather all the ideas on the newest trends in street machining. One of the more noticeable differences between the Street Machine Nationals and the vast majority of other car shows was at this event, there were no roped off displays or stanchions. There were few, if any, do not touch signs or anything else to strongly discourage spectators from getting right up close to the many meticulously prepared cars covering the show area. We asked Susan, why not? I think that the spectators, we've been in DeCoin for about six years, and I think the spectators appreciate the amount of time and energy that's and money that's gone into these vehicles. And the, you don't see a whole bunch of don't touch this car signs because the people understand uh, how much pride goes into these vehicles, and they walk around, and, and you see tons of video cameras and tons of still cameras, and these people are documenting all the cars because most of the spectators here have a project in their garage that's half finished and their dream is to get it done in time for the coin next year this is their goal every June they know where they're going to be and so they're out gathering ideas and so they're very um, respectful of the other vehicles that are here before we take a close-up look at some of the more exceptional street machines attending this year's nationals we wanted to show you one of the more unusual projects which was taking place over the entire three days of the show a work team from Bell Tech was involved in a venture named From Mild to Wild in 55 Hours, which basically involved taking a new Ford F-150 flare side pickup donated by one of the major event sponsors, Ford Trucks, and right before the curious gazes of the many spectators filing in, modifying the bone stock pickup into a full-fledged street machine with tricked out suspension, drivetrain, and cosmetics. Many of the enthusiasts who strolled past the Belltech work area were seeing the amount of skill, forethought, and attention to detail required to build a first-rate street machine for the first time. Later on, we'll see how the completed mile-to-wild -wild project truck turned out. But now, Let's get a real horsepower fix and cozy up to some of the hottest rides that swaggered into DeCoin this year and talk to their owners and builders. Mike Lloyd from Decatur, Illinois brought this eye-popping Pro Street 1972 GTO. It would go on to win best paint and graphics in the pro-engineered category and play second overall in the pro-engineered voting. I've had the car seven years, this project, the final project on the car took two years it was built by uh, Gebhardt's Pro Street Cars in Jacksonville, Illinois. Uh, paint was done by Kim's Auto Body in Springfield, Illinois. It's uh, predominantly purple with uh, neon pink, neon shark truce, and uh, tri -blue pearl graphics on it. It's a full chassis car, narrowed rear end, four length suspension, uh, strut front end, has a full floater strange rear end in it. Engines uh, was done by Racing Head Service. 497 cubic inch Pontiac, uh, Ram, Pontiac Ram Air four heads, uh, Larry Winsler tunnel ram intake with uh, Barry Grant, uh, two Barry Grant dominators on it. Uh, it's 
uh, dynoed at 863 horsepower without nitrous, has a full uh, nitrous fogger system on it, capable of 500 additional horsepower, should run uh, low nines, high eights and a quarter mile when we get the whole car dialed in. They're doing a photo shoot this evening, uh, be a full studio layout this evening with Hot Rod. Be, been, that's one of my dreams to get it in the magazines. It's been a full family project, supported my wife, my dad, my mom. I'd just like to thank everybody that's helped me get this, get this car the way it looks today. Rod Sabry and his lady, Tina Veets, from Millers, Maryland, were showing off this radical 57 Corvette that's been recognized as one of the country's fastest street legal cars. This 57 Corvette we have here, and uh, it's uh, a show car, plus we do drive it, and we race it some. And uh, the car, as you can see from the tag, runs in eight second range at 157 miles an hour with, uh, through the exhaust with all the street equipment. And uh, it's a blast. It's the second time out here for me. First time with this car. I've had a 59 vet last time I was out here. And uh, this is my girlfriend Tina's first time out here. And, you think it's Tina? Oh, I love it. It's great. I'm yeah. having a ball. <laughs> yeah, this is how we met at a, a kind of a car show deal or through cars. And uh, we really enjoy it together. It's something that you can do together. Another potent Pro Street Corvette made the Nationals all the way from Bristol, Oklahoma, this bright red 1960, property of Dr. Fred Lamport and his son, Freddie III. We've had it since it was new. Okay. My uncle bought it when I was in high school and gave it to me. Totally uh, off the frame, 3671 blower, 372 cubic inch, four side draft Weber's. The uh, car was built by Johnny Young out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. All the fabrication was done by Larry Rogers out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, the car was built five years ago. The paint job on it is five years old. All the interior was done by uh, Skip Rollins out of Oklahoma City, Coachwork Interiors. I had quite a few offers for it, but uh, it goes to my son when he's 18. If a top-shelf street machine must combine great appearance, unparalleled engineering, road-ripping horsepower, and a side order of originality and creativity, this car may well represent one of the country's most prime examples. Featured on the cover of the August 1992 Hot Rod magazine, this is Troy Trepanier's ultra-wild 1950 Buick, the car that would go on to win the Pro Show Class Championship best paint and graphics in Pro Show, best engineered, best interior, and best engine in the Pro Show division. Not bad when you consider Troy drove the car to the coin, all the way from his hometown of Mantino, Illinois. It's a 1950 Buick Saturnette. Um, the only thing original on the car is the exterior sheet metal. Um, it has a full tube chassis. All the floor, when I bought the car, was real good, but we channeled the body over the frame so the floor is raised in the car. It's got a 510-inch Bowtie Chevy. It's digital fuel injected with three-stage nitrous. Um, made 807 horse on the dyno on 92-octane gas. Uh, we drove the car from Chicago here. Uh, it has four-wheel disc brakes, rack and pinion steering, air conditioning, digital dash, um, a Denon disc changer with 19 speakers, uh, electric windows, electric trunk, uh, electric doors. Uh, gets 11 miles at a gallon. Money-wise, um, not counting our personal labor, probably about 60 grand. My father, he got me into this. He used to race um, drag cars and then circle track cars. And uh, it's a family deal. We come, my mom and dad come to all the shows with me. And uh, we have a good time with it. Another very popular attraction at the 92 Street Machine Nationals was the McCord Engine Build Challenge. Two of the top engine builders in Winston Cup Racing, Ron Vaccaro of Alan Kowicki's racing team, and Tony Cola of Cale Yarbrough Motorsports, squared off in this virtual drag race for mechanics, hoping to assemble a fully dismantled 5-liter Ford V8 before the other guy. The completed engines were required to fire up and run for one minute in determining the winner. With a challenge scheduled on both Saturday and Sunday, each day saw a different winner. On Saturday, Ron Vaccaro finished first with a time of 49 minutes and 18 seconds. Sunday, Tony Cola took the honors at 41 minutes, 32 seconds. <laughs> sort of made you wonder why your neighborhood mechanic takes eight hours just to give your five-liter Mustang a tune-up. 
Meanwhile, over at the Fairground Stadium, a big crowd had settled in to watch the No Touch Tire Care burnout competition. Contestants pull their cars onto a soaked down skid plate and then mash the throttle, attempting to outsmoke the other guys. And what better prize to be shooting for than a set of new BF Goodrich radios? Here's the winning burnout performed by Jim Swain of Paducah, Kentucky in his red 1970 Chevelle. Right now, let's head back to the show area and track down some more of the country's baddest street machines at the 92 Street Machine Nationals. Like Kenny Durham's reworked 1968 Mustang from Kathleen, Georgia. I've owned the car 14 years. It was my first car. I had it, I got it when I was 17. And uh, it, I've been building it for over 14 years, but I've just recently redone it in the last three years with the new paint and body as it is. It's got a highly modified body. The boilers on the front and rear handmade. The side air scoops were handmade. And the engine compartment, has got over a thousand hours in the engine compartment cheering and remanufacturing a new firewall and inner fender wells. It has uh, two four-barrel Holley carburetors with an Offenhauser polished intake. The, in, the inside of the engine has been highly modified uh, with roller valve train, crane cam, polished heads. Uh, I did the paint and body and everything but the polishing on the intake was done by Bobby Bowman in Warner Robins, Georgia. When I was about 13, my dad started taking me to car shows, and I started going. Then when I turned 17, I got the car for my 17th birthday. It was a, wasn't in near this condition. And then I started working at a body shop after school, and that's where I learned how to do the body and paint. And I worked there for years, and that's where I did the body and paint when I, at the body shops. Al Hines from Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, owns this Pro Street 92 Chevy Lumina, a car which finished in the top three in voting in five pro-engineered classes. Best interior, best engineered, best supercharged, best engine compartment, and first in best engine. Uh, basically, we took a front-wheel drive car and turned it into a rear-wheel drive car. Full tube chassis, uh, stretched the front fenders, flipped the hood forward. And we had to cut the windshield four inches out of it so we could set the motor back in. Um, it's got a unique rear suspension with the shocks mounted behind the seat instead of on, on every other car. They're on the, okay. on the rear end itself. We got, we got and it's got 510-inch okay. uh, Chevrolet motor in it, supercharged and electronic fuel injected. This car took nine months to, to put together, but we sort of had it planned out before that. Once you build one or two, it gets a little easier. You know what you want to do with it. Well, the magazines actually mean more to me than actually winning, a, winning an award. Uh, it's good exposure for myself as well as the people that help do stuff on the car and provide us with some parts. And not only that, people get to see the car everywhere. It's enjoyed by everybody and not just myself. Not all of the cars attending the Street Machine Nationals were unique from a purely artistic viewpoint. Uh, some were obviously one of a kind based on sheer lunacy. We caught up to Jeff Smith and asked him what he thought was the strangest street machine that had ever shown up. Well, yeah, the, perhaps the wildest car we saw was, oh, I'd say 1979-1980, the Street Machine Nationals when it was in Indianapolis. Uh, a gentleman built a, uh, a late model, at that time a late model Corvette, and it was completely, the body had a shark nose to it, it had these organ pipes for exhaust and it had dual controls out of an aircraft. So the butterfly steering wheels on both sides. And, but the weirdest part of the whole car was the fact that it was entirely covered in a, in a silicone elastic gel. It wasn't painted, it had these, you know how you'll take a cake and you'll flip it up at the end to have those little curly cues? It was all over the car. And the guy was going crazy because people were walking up touching it and they wanted to pull him off the car. He's going nuts trying to keep people from pulling stuff off the car. I don't know whatever happened to the car. I don't know if it still exists or not, but that was one of the wilder cars we saw. There was another guy that showed up one year in a, in a 442, late model 442, around the same, in fact, it was the same year at the Nationals. That was the weird year. I don't know, something in the water, maybe. And uh, he was towing a casket behind this car, and it had this plastic arm coming out of it, and a big sign on the side of the casket said, drive 55 or die. 
uh, and he drew, wore a complete uh, a tuxedo with a top hat with tails and the whole bit and just towed the thing around the Nationals and that guy was warped. The 92 Street Machine Nationals glittered with its own brand of show business flash. Under the purple tint of an overhead canopy, Cadzilla, perhaps one of Boyd Coddington's most notorious projects, built for the bearded weirdos of rock and roll's ZZ Top, hunkered down in its most menacing pose. Along with two Hogzilla Harley-Davidson bikes, and perhaps the most familiar street rod in America, ZZ Top's inimitable Eliminator. Nearby, the people from Star Cars of Sedalia, Missouri, were displaying two Lincolns, one which belonged to Marilyn Monroe, and another which once belonged to Elvis. Well, I was an entertainer for several years, and I knew Elvis, and uh, uh, Jimmy Velvet, who has the Elvis Presley Museums, is uh, a friend of mine, and I purchased uh, the car from the Elvis Presley Museum, and then, of course, the Marilyn Monroe uh, car was at uh, court-ordered auction. Uh, we're, we're quite pleased with them. We think they're kind of exceptional cars. They're not just everyday cars. There's something special about all of them. The fascination with the Elvis Presley cars, you know, Elvis had a lot of cars that he gave away, very few personal cars. Uh, this car he personally went to the dealership and got for himself, and it's the one that's featured on the Graceland postcard, uh, parked in, at the front door. Uh, it's 24-karat uh, gold uh, appointments on it. Uh, it's just not uh, your everyday Lincoln Continental. And this is definitely not your everyday 85 Camaro. Owned by Richard Boyd of Albany, Georgia, it would go on to win the Pro Series overall grand championship. Not to mention Pro Street Class Championship, Best Pro Street Supercharged, Best Pro Street Paint and Graphics, Best Pro Street Engine Compartment, Best Pro Street Engine, and Best Pro Street Engineer. This 1971 Chevelle, belonging to Frank Guidus of Mercer, Pennsylvania, won Best Engine Compartment in the Pro Show category and finished third overall for Pro Show Class Champion. The car runs on uh, alcohol. It's got two methanol two-barrel carburetors on it, which is kind of different. A lot of guys have never tried that setup before. Uh, it's got twin uh, funny car cages inside with all leather-wrapped interior, red and gray leather-wrapped interior. Uh, another new thing we tried this year is turbo starch racing batteries, 16-volt uh, racing batteries in the car, which is working out good with the digital dash and electronic ignition we got in the car. I've been working on this car, I've had it for probably six years, been working on the car uh, for the shows about three years. About the last three years we've been doing the modifications to the car. Uh, I guess the ultimate goal, maybe a part of it's already been reached. Uh, uh, we won uh, the Pro Series in uh, Canfield this year, and I, I guess the goal now is, is to keep going, is to be Hot Rodder Carcraft's top 10 car. 57 Chevys have occupied a special place in street machine legend and lore for a long time. The more traditional approach to tricking out a 57 usually means a Chevy small block under the hood that's been breathed on. Some sharp paint and a set of appropriate wheels, too. So you can imagine how heads turned and fingers pointed when this 57 idled into the coin, having undergone the full pro street treatment. Bob Whalen of Riverside, Illinois is the owner. The car's a 1957 Chevrolet 150 two-door sedan, and it's been pro streeted, and the car was built in uh, my garage by three, three friends. Two years worth of work, about $45,000. Since I was about 10, I used to go up where, you know, the people used to hang out, and I was always, you know, enjoy them. And I had this car since 1975, but I never could afford to do too much with it, and then saved a lot of money. And two years ago, we started on it and, you know, finished the car up. Uh, I've been in many competitions. We had Super Chevy Sunday at Indian Indianapolis last year. Been in many local shows around Chicago. Uh, normally always win something with the car. Best of show a couple times, a lot of first places, a couple second places, so I'm pretty happy about that. This Pro Street 1951 Ford is the handiwork of Joe Brown from Carlisle, Illinois. It was a top five finisher in three Pro Show categories. Best paint and graphics, best interior, and first place runner-up in best engine. I bought it from a salvage yard, and uh, we, we started from scratch and took the body off the frame and just went from the ground up on it. It took about nine months, and it, you know, that, it was a lot of spare time, a lot of nighttime work, but in nine months we had it done. Any hobby you get into is expensive, but you know, you get so far into a car and 
it's hard to stop. So you just got to keep going, and before you know it, you've got more money than you expected to put into it. But, you know, that's, that's the way hobbies go. It's a lot of fun. We drive it a lot. Uh, my wife enjoys it, which is a big help, because if your wife doesn't like what you're doing, it can be kind of miserable at times. But she enjoys it. I enjoy it. So it works out real good. The reason I bought this was it's different. Um, I'm not one that likes to have the same thing everybody else has got. And I saw this sitting in a junkyard, and like I said, it was a hard top. It's, it's a rare car, so that's that's why we did it, just because it was different. It's got lines to it. It doesn't look like anybody else's car. Uh, we go to a lot of small shows at home, but this, this to us is the ultimate, because you can see everything and anything. And the people are nice. They treat you good, and they got nice grounds. It, it's just a good place to go, and it's close to where I live. That helps, too. Back at the Belltech Mile to Wild Truck Project, work was rapidly progressing. We happened to catch a painter shooting the flare side's tailgate. He introduced himself and told us what he was up to. My name's Rocky Robertson, and I own my own business. I do auto body work, and we're, uh, we're on the last day of the, the Mile to Wild in 55 hours, and I've just applied uh, the last coat of clear that you just saw. Um, there's about, we put about 10 coats of regular lacquer base coat on it and cut it down with 1500. Then I uh, cleared it, give it about five coats of clear. And uh, basically we're gonna let this dry four or five hours. Uh, this is the back, um, um, back roll panel. We uh, painted it and cleared it, it's drying. It's gonna be ready to assemble. And around three o'clock we'll rub the whole unit out and, and uh, It'll shine like it, like it did factory, and it ought to make a real clean job. And we'll see the finished truck in just a little while. Since showing you every single street machine which attended the Street Machine Nationals would be utterly impossible on this tape, why not jump on an appropriate set of wheels with us and cruise the DuCoin State Fairgrounds for the next few minutes as we scope out some of the sights and sounds of the 92 Nationals.
It was time once again to check back over at the fairground stadium. No, it was not the burnout competition again, although you might say there was plenty of heat being generated. It was the Miss Street Machine Nationals competition, which attracted an enthusiastic field of contestants. Tina Vietz, who we met earlier with her boyfriend Rod Sabry from Millers, Maryland, was one of the contestants. The contestants were introduced to the appreciative audience and asked a few brief questions about themselves. Uh, uh, did I mention they were wearing bikinis? Uh, oh, you noticed. A panel of judges was empowered with the task of choosing not only Miss Street Machine Nationals, but also a second and third runner-up. It was an event which, to say the least, sustained a firm grip on the attention spans of the numerous interested onlookers. And then the winners were announced. Second runner-up was Deanna Glenn of Mountain Grove, Missouri. First runner-up was Tasha Reed of Johnston City, Illinois. And Miss Street Machine Nationals for 1992 was Erin Blacklock from Murfreesboro, Illinois, who received, along with a trophy, $500 in cash. While the winners of the Miss Street Machine Nationals were getting their pictures taken, there were several other photo shoots going on elsewhere on the fairgrounds. These were the Hot Rod Magazine photo sessions, in which several of the country's most spectacular street machines were being photographed for future issues of Hot Rod. We've already seen the gorgeous Pro Street Oldsmobile of Chris Embry of Indianapolis, Indiana, and Al Hines 92 Lumina from Ontario, Canada. Other cars which were chosen for this enviable honor were Johnny Londigan's Super 1951 Mercury. Dick Kohler's wild 1968 Chevy pickup. And with a residential backdrop near the fairgrounds, that fantastic 1950 Buick of Troy Trepin. Jeff Smith talked about the selection process in choosing cars for hot rod features. The determining factor really is probably a quality and attention to detail. The type of vehicle that we choose isn't nearly as important as the workmanship that goes into it. Uh, as example by this truck behind me, a uh, very highly crafted, crafted car the owner's built himself. Uh, and that's the thing that we look for, and especially a car that has all the attention to detail, is as clean and well executed as any kind of a show car, and yet something that he drives, that he, he can actually drive on the street. Now we do shoot a lot of very exotic cars that don't really get driven a lot on the street, never intended to be driven on the street. They are very much show cars rather than street cars. Um, we will shoot those kinds of cars too, because they're exotic, the readers like to see them, they're fun, and you can get a lot of ideas from them. But the, the premier car would be the kind of car that uh, has all of those inherent qualities, plus be able to drive the car, too. Our involvement with this event began about 1977. John Bechtel is the editor of CarCraft magazine, the publication which launched the concept of the Street Machine Nationals. We've been supporting this event as much as possible every year. We bring out uh, our entire staff to photograph the cars. And I think it's important in these difficult economic times um, to support the people who come into this event because um, a lot of them are out of work, a lot of them are having, having tough times, but they're still building cars because they're enthusiasts. And um, nothing seems to stop them from doing it. Um, so our main mission is to support those guys and make sure that they have a, a venue to show off their work. And Terry Booth from Lawrenceville, Georgia, had a lot of work to show off. His tricked out 1970 Chevelle won third place in best paint and graphics in Pro Street. Started out original car about eight months ago. We changed it to a Pro Street. Got about $30,000 in it in seven months. 
It's got a long way to go. I'm going to spend about another 15, 20,000 on it before I'm through. We're going to stainless steel the whole bottom of it, like the trunk and then under the hood and all. Oh, it's the biggest show I've ever been to in my life. I had never seen it. It's awesome. You know, when you come up here, if you don't win, you go home, you don't feel bad because there's so many pretty cars up here, you can't feel bad, you know. That's a good thing about this show. Scott Sullivan of Dayton, Ohio, built this flawless, slammed Pro Street 57 Chevy. It would become one of the top finishers in the Pro Street Best Engine Voting. But this car, like other ones Scott has built, isn't a trailer queen. It gets driven. In fact, Jeff Smith shared a story with us which points out how Scott's approach to street machines reflects the true philosophy of the sport. About uh, three, four years ago, a uh, gentleman, Scott Sullivan, built a 55 Chevy. And his concept was to build a 55 Chevy that was capable of winning the best car uh, award here at this event, which is sort of the, the pinnacle event for the year for the street machiners, and, and still be able to take the car and drive it from here to Los Angeles and back again. And uh, we did a story on that. I rode with him and we drove the car out. We had a few problems. We broke some parts, and, and which made the story much better. I got stuck in the middle of the desert in, Ohio, or in, in um, Idaho and then went on to Los Angeles. The car ran 10-second uh, ETs, the drag strip, and then he drove it back to Ohio where he lives. And uh, that represents really sort of the focus of the street machines right now. Chris Embry, 1990. Late afternoon on Sunday the 21st. And one of the proudest moments in the life of any street machine owner has arrived. The award ceremony. It is Chevy. at this time that the winners and runners up in the many categories of competition, both in the pro and show and shine competitions, receive the congratulations and recognition that they've worked so hard to earn. Last champions. Close to 150 awards, representing over 40 classes of competition. Congratulations. Congratulations to all the winners and runners-up at the 1992 Street Machine Nationals. And congratulations to the crew from Belltech, who rolled out the results of their 55 hours of non-stop work. The Mild to Wild Project Truck. The 92 Ford Flare side definitely looked hot. And why not? Pickup trucks have become the street machine of choice for thousands of cruise fanatics across the country. Lowered suspensions, engine tweaks, slick paint and graphics, polished alloy wheels, and high-end sound systems have all helped to make the pickup truck a righteous ride on any boulevard. And the Bell Tech project proved that, with enough manpower, it's a job that doesn't have to take forever. And so, the 1992 Street Machine Nationals, the 16th annual edition of this power crazy weekend, were now history. And as the cold winter months waited just over the horizon, so also did the many expectations of what the 1993 Nationals would provide. Over the next 12 months, there would be many hours of hard work and preparation, making changes to cars already built and beginning construction on those that are not building a street machine. This exclusively American phenomenon has been played out for the better half of this century. A wildly creative avenue of personal expression. A dazzling method of combining art and physics. Using chrome, paint, and the imagination as a sculpture uses clay to mold and shape stunning creations that bring thunder to the pavement and pleasure to the eye. The Street Machine Nationals. An event which every June turns a quiet Midwestern town into the street machine capital of the world.